Hey everybody, it's Matt Powers. I want to talk to you today about effective microbes. So it's called EM. People are brewing it. They're solving problems with it. What is it? Well, the reality is that whole anaerobic, aerobic um, debate really has a middle section. Facultative. These microbes that go into both regions, um, some of them you know. There's yeast. You know, there's um, lactic acid bacteria, you know, lactobacillus. You know what I mean? These are things that we ferment with. These are things that we make probiotics with. Um, this is stuff that we know. Uh, we make wine and beer and bread. And so um, purple non-sulfur bacteria is the other in the consortium, the other major one in the consortium of effective microbes. And that is from the gut digestion of earthworms. It's also found in manure lagoons. It feeds four ways, it feeds on light. It's, it's really fantastic. So um, we have to keep in mind that um, these microbes do incredible things, that they're facultative. EM um, is a solution that is a surprising one. And it's also kind of familiar and makes sense. Uh, when we've been throwing away the waste for in all the different cultures and then in the waste pits We've been throwing, you know our fermentation waste our brewing waste and This kind of understanding has cropped up in different ways in different places all over the world at different times throughout history We have these different consortiums that we um, take in for our bodies that we know and recognize like kefir I've got some kefir right here um, by my side uh, along with the um, EM that I'm brewing and that I'm going to be using actually today to, to, to solve a problem. And uh, we make kefir and kombucha for the health of our body to revitalize our bodies. And we do the same thing with EM. We use EM as a probiotic for the soil and for actually even aquatic environments as well. So it's really incre incredibly amazing. EM1 by uh, Terraganics. They sell that on Amazon. It's really awesome. Um, my original culture came from Quatamuk Via, uh, who learned with the same person who started uh, do, doing the EM1. And uh, they smell exactly the same. Um, and it's, they, they're incredible products and you can scale them up. It's just one part molasses, one part EM and 20 parts water. You close it for two weeks, two to three weeks, wait for the pH drop down between three and 3.5 and then you know you're there. Make sure it's a sealed container, no air in it, um, and allow it to have room to expand and contract, and you'll be golden. Um, so I've got some containers here. I wanna show you what this looks like. So this right here is kefir. So I'm just gonna open some kefir right here and show you what that looks like. So kefir is a probiotic drink. It's one of my favorite drinks. It's fizzy, it's beautiful, it's wonderful. I love it. When I first had it, I had instant relief, absolute instant relief after drinking this. And so this is a probiotic for the gut, um, but this right here is EM. This is my, my EM. Um, obviously this is not the container for EM, but this is what I'm using. You can see here that it's, it's, it's so much fatter than the other one. It's, it's just pushed so hard because there's so much pressure because the life is working so hard in here. So I'm gonna be using this in this, uh, this dispenser right here, and we're going to be able to uh, water it down and use it in, in the mix, in the soil, and on the plants, and in the compost. So what's so great about EM? What's it really doing? I mean, you've said what it is, Matt, but why is it important? How does it actually solve problems? Well, the incredible thing about EM is it has the ability to take nitrogen compounds, you know, the stinky things that are, are in our manure, in our, comp, uh, in our compost, in our wastes, um, even in our human manure, and it's able to flip it into amino acids. It's able to ferment it in place. It's able to transform it. And amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. So it's essentially making it so that it's plant available, it's in a soluble plant form, they can just slurp that up and eat it and take it in and then turn it into plant proteins, which is gonna make better food for us, which is gonna make better nutrition for the plant. Um, and then the soil food uh, web economy, they're gonna just be thriving because of all this activity and support. 
So EM is a way to also cool that compost off and make it so that it doesn't go above 130, 131 Fahrenheit, so that it doesn't get too hot. Those nitrogen compounds that are the catalyst in that reaction are now taken down. And so the decomposition process is happening at a much cooler rate. And you're like, wait, but the heat, well, the heat is replaced by a different action. It's the fermentation action. So it's, a, it's like a burn. It's a transformation process, like a burn, but it's not a burn. It's an inoculation process and a transformation process. And a, you're basically making the nutrition more bioavailable as you do when you, you know, ferment food. It's a pre-digestion process. And that's what EM is doing for us. So EM makes makes things more readily available, and then it participates in the secession. So it um, does all these services and then bows out, and then you can't find um, the EM consortium in the actual environment, the soil environment, the aquatic environment, after a period of time. And so it gets consumed, it gets embodied, and it, and it cycles on. So it's not something that's persistent, it's not something that's um, invasive, it's not something that's damaging, it's a service, it's really incredible. And the, the cool thing about EM is if you, if you think about you know, the story of, of where it came from and how it came to be, it's, it's rather fascinating. So Quatamuk Via, in my course, the Advanced Permaculture Student Online, um, he teaches biochar, he teaches bokashi, talks about bioceramics and EM. And he was talking about how in the Amazon, there were, were researchers, and this is where they originally found the EM consortium. And in my mind now, I'm realizing that, of course, the Amazonians were fermenting. Um, this is, you know, where this is the same culture that was fermenting uh, corn, teosinte, to make beer. This is the same culture um, that definitely has something like lactic acid bacteria, lactobacillus. They were doing some sort of fermentation, some sort of uh, preservation. And then they were putting their humanure, their food waste, um, and in their fire pits. So it was that biochar because of the life in there. And then on top of that, because cultures are doing that all over the world, what was so special about this? Well, in the Amazon, it's a facultative environment because of the water is soaking the soil bank so often that it's not an aerobic environment. I know we have that aerobic only debate going on, right? But th that's kind of a North American perspective. Um, and European perspective because in the Amazon, in the tropical rainforests, they're facultative because it gets soaked. The water, you know, soaks up, fills all those interstitial spaces that the air wants out and it's no longer aerobic. Um, the, the life has to exist in that oxygen um, deprived state so they need to be facultative. And the reason we know this is happening, the reason we know this is um, important to notice is because in the undisturbed rainforest, there's legumes that are not nodulating. In the disturbed rainforest, those same legumes are nodulating. They're creating an area where there's no oxygen so that the nitrogen fixers have privacy from oxygen so that they can fix those, that nitrogen into amino acids. And then they, once they have enough of them, it goes back into the plant and the plant gets a return on its investment in relationship with rhizobium and they get the amino acids to form the proteins that they, they, they want to form as a plant. So when I think about all this stuff and I think about it, the fact that the rain itself is nitrogenous in the rainforest, we've got a composition event happening in the soil continuously. We have a facultative environment. So we have facultative microbes that are already present. And the manure pits in the Amazon provided a training ground for these microbes to learn to partner with the behaviors of human beings. And as they spread and as those manure pits became to connect with each other over time, these microbes became um, more and more communicated within each other and became scaling up and scaling up, best of, best of. And you got terra preta going forever and ever and ever in those areas, so deep, so widespread. And that soil, that rich soil, was created in a facultative environment, non aerobic soil environment. So it's kind of like um, a big reveal, you know, for some folks 
Um, but it's really important to take this on board. It's really important to understand where our tropical brothers and sisters are coming from um, when they're working with this stuff because this is, this is just a natural part of their biome, of their rhizosphere, of the biology that is present. So EM came out of that. And before you're like, oh, but that's a tropical thing. Is EM gonna work for me up here? Oh yeah, it totally does. It totally goes on with the secession. It, it, it gets processed, it, it dissipates, it gets consumed, it gets transformed. And so it's a safe thing, it's a powerful thing, it's incredible. Look at it under the scope, you know, see the amazing things that EM can do. And so we're gonna be building a, a compost heap with EM here in a second. But I wanted to tell you about EM. I wanted to tell you about how amazing it is. And if you wanna learn a lot more about EM, you wanna learn how to make it, you wanna learn how to make Bokashi, join the Advanced Permaculture Student Online, check out my books, or stay tuned for Permaculture Soil Science and Solutions, the book and online course that's being kickstarted starting September 9th, Monday. Everybody tune in, I'm gonna be there. It's gonna be absolutely amazing. I'm so excited. So grow abundantly, learn daily, and compost regeneratively. I'm Matt Powers, see you soon. <laughs>